Good morning. Our first reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 51, verses 1 through 6. Listen to me, you who who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be Our psalm today comes from Psalm 138, and I ask you to read responsively. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the high he knows from far. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of Romans, which is written by the Apostle Paul, chapter 11, starting at verse 33, and continued through chapter 12, verse 8. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and the knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? From him and through him and to him are all are all things. To him be glory, glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore... Brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. 
Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Our gospel lesson for this morning is going to be found again in the book of Matthew. We're looking at chapter 17, uh, beginning at verse 13. Glory to you, Lord. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and some others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. Let's open this morning with prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this new day and for this time to gather with our brothers and sisters in Christ to worship you. Father, you have blessed us in so many ways, even to the point of sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And as we come to worship this morning, we ask that you open our hearts and minds to hear and to believe in all that Christ has done for us. May the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning's reading from Matthew is focused on one of the key events of Jesus' life, his ministry. It revolves around this question, one which each of us must ultimately answer. Who do you say Jesus is? It's an important question for today, as for today there are many false understandings of who Jesus is. In his book, Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? Dr. Matthew Richard identifies 12 false Christs which are false views of who Jesus actually is. These range from kind of benign ones, like Jesus the mascot, the cheerleader, the one who's there to cheer us along every day, encourage us every day. Jesus the option among many. That's prevalent today, isn't it? Jesus the good teacher. Nothing too outstanding about that one. This, these next two, though, and the ranges, these are on the far end of it. We have Jesus, the national patriot. That's prevalent in many churches today. And this one, Jesus, the social justice warrior. These false views of Jesus abound even in churches which proclaim to be Christian. The setting for this morning's reading is that the disciples had been with Jesus for just over two years. And at the center of his ministry up to this point was Jesus' desires that these disciples would come to know who he is and to understand what his mission was for us. To be sure, there were actually times when the apostles seemed to get it. For example, Nathaniel declares in John chapter 1, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. 
And his declaration comes merely because Jesus has seen him from a long way off. After Jesus turned the water into wine at Cana, we read in John chapter 2, and his disciples believed in him. And then just a few weeks ago, we spoke of Jesus walking on the water, which resulted in the disciples worshiping him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. But it wasn't until our gospel reading this morning that a human being declares Jesus to be the Christ. And this declaration comes in response to a question that Jesus asked, but who do you say that I am? We too have heard the gospel, haven't we? And it is by the power of the Holy Spirit alone that we too confess Jesus. For the true and foundational confession of God, Christ's church is that Jesus is the Christ. Our narrative this morning takes place in what had been the land of Canaan, in a revitalized city dedicated to the Roman Emperor Caesar. And Jesus comes to the area alone with his 12 disciples. And it is in this place where Jesus would re reveal himself as the Messiah, the Christ, which means the anointed one, anointed of God. And it's, it's a title which encompasses everything about Jesus, who he is, and what he, has been, he was sent here to do. The population of this area is predominantly Gentile, that is, non-Jewish. Idol worship is prolific in this area, especially the worship of the Greek god Pan, which, um, for whom the nearby city of Peneus was named, and it's a foreboding place. It's a place of idols. It's a place of rocky outcrops. It's a place of caves. It's a dark place, both physically and spiritually. Jesus, he's concluded his ministry in, in Galilee, and the people of Galilee had seen and they'd marveled at his miracles. So undoubtedly, the disciples, if they had mingled about in the crowds that followed Jesus, had heard what they'd been saying about him. And Jesus asks this question, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Good question. Jesus often refers to himself as the Son of Man in the scriptures, and he uses this designation again today because he's about to tell the disciples again of his upcoming passion. And the disciples, as you heard, respond with various names, and they said, some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, and others the Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. You'll note that each response was of a key religious figure or prophet in the Jewish faith. Even today, many people think of Jesus only as some important religious figure, or as an important teacher, or even as an example for us to follow. In a follow and living moral lives. But to know Jesus in these ways is not enough. Jesus is the Christ. You may recall the words of the angels to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The real Jesus of the scriptures must be confessed to be the Son of God, for he is indeed God's Son. And the disciples needed to know this, for this confessing of Jesus as the Christ was essential in order for his mission to progress. You and I need to know and confess Jesus as the Christ as well in order to be saved. You may have noticed that Jesus, he didn't respond to what the people were saying about who he was, did he? Because what the people were thinking was not important. The question was merely a prelude to what was really the important question for both the disciples in our reading and for you and me this morning, but who do you say that I am? Peter, speaking for the group here, boldly replies, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And we have talked about Peter many times in our readings. He's a, got a reputation for being somewhat impulsive. After all, we just heard of Jesus or Peter telling uh, Jesus to have him step out of the safety on the boat and walk towards him on the water. Peter does for a few steps. Even after Peter's confession in this morning's reading, he will tell Jesus that he will never deny him. Yet each Lenten season, we hear of how well Peter held up to that boast, don't we? As we hear of him denying Jesus not once, but three times. Once with an oath. But before we sit here and condemn Peter, I think it's, we each need to realize that there's a little bit of that Peter in each of us. But thanks be to God that he is patient with us and always invites us to repent and receive again his offer of forgiveness through the blood of his son. The scriptures tell us that no one is able to say Christ Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus verifies the truth of his claim as he tells Peter, who has just made this powerful confession on behalf of the twelve disciples, that Peter only spoke what had been revealed to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in verse 17, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And these words should be a great comfort to each of us as believers because we find in these words that our very faith is from Christ alone. You and I have revelation of the Bible. We have the witness of the prophets and of the apostles presented to us in its words as well. And it's quite likely that Peter had these words in, uh, of Jesus in mind when he writes of the inspiration of God in the scriptures. Peter writes, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And we, as Lutherans, are reminded of this truth each time we read from Luther's small catechism, the explanation of the third article. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. There are Christians who will find this statement particularly difficult to say because by our own human nature we want to do something for or have a part in or be able to take some piece of credit for our salvation. But that's the problem. We can't. It is God, the Holy Spirit, who must and does it all for all who believe. It is by the word of God preached and by the sacraments of baptism and communion that we find that we receive the forgiveness of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. It is by his power alone that we are able to confess Jesus as the son of the living God. The confession that Jesus, the son of man and son of God, is the Christ is a key part of the Christian foundation, or the Christian church, I'm sorry. We hear these words of Paul as he tells us that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets in Ephesians chapter 2. He also tells us in Colossians chapter 2 that it is the word of Christ, and that it's in that word that we are rooted and established. You may recall that Jesus first gives Peter his new name in John chapter 1, where he says, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And in our reading this morning, Jesus responds to Peter's confession by calling him by his new name and by reminding him that his name means rock. And what makes Peter a rock? It's not his name, nor is it this morning's confession. What makes Peter a rock is the revelation of the Holy Spirit which brings about his confession of Jesus as the Christ. Peter speaks for all 12 of the disciples, himself included. The confession is what 
that he makes, it's rock solid. The church is not founded on any one person except for Jesus Christ alone. It is by this confession that he is the Christ and by the witness and testimony of his apostles that Jesus builds his church. To this church, Jesus promises that he will give the keys to heaven. We read, I will give you, which in the work of the Greek is plural. So now this promise is not going to Peter. This promise is going to the disciples. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And Jesus is speaking here of forgiveness or the retention of sin. Jesus fulfills this promise when he comes to the apostles that first Easter evening and he says to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. We, as the church of Christ, have received these keys, and they are the preaching of the gospel and proclamation of forgiveness of sin to all who repent. These keys open the door to heaven for all who believe and repent. But to those who will not repent, these keys bind. Hell, is, hell too is locked, but in a, a unique way. The grave that threatens all with death and would, it would hold all who enter it, but the gates of hell cannot hold those who belong to Jesus. We read in Romans chapter 6, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism by baptism in death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. By Jesus' death on that cross, and by his resurrection three days later, Jesus Christ has freed us from death, and he's freed us from the grave. For those in Christ, Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 suddenly become true. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? With Christ, our true enemies, the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh, which we have to confess threatens us constantly, all of these are overcome. These would have us give up and lose all hope. And the sad truth is that all who remain unrepentant do remain slaves to sin. But Christ has come to set us free, to liberate us from that sin. In the words following our lesson in Matthew, Jesus will tell his disciples that he must suffer and die. This is the reason the Son of Man has come into this world. Only the God-man, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully human, is the true Savior of the world. He keeps his promises, and he fills, fulfills the Old Testament. He suffered and died, shedding his blood so that we might have eternal life. None of the false Jesuses you will find in this world today have done that. And not one of them can say that they will do that. Only the Jesus of the scriptures is the son of the living God. Just as Jesus gathered his disciples and showed them the way, so also he calls, gathers, and enlightens us this morning by his Holy Spirit. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to us, but by the Spirit, through the words of the gospel, we are his and live under him in his kingdom. Brothers and sisters in Christ, these are God's promises given for you 
and fulfilled for you by the cross of Jesus. But now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.